and uh, I'm a writer, uh, though none of my books are available here or anywhere else, really. Yeah, they're all out of print. Um, I came to uh, punk in a completely different way than the uh, people who were up here talking about before. I, I came to it as a really a record collector and uh, came to the uh, scene as a, as a musical subgroup. Um, I was involved in uh, fanzines prior to uh, the actual uh, beginning of punk, um, back in the sort of dead end glam days and that kind of thing. But I was a you know music fan. All my friends were like collectors, and we just like you know lived out in North Jersey and bought records and talked about them and went into New York on the weekends and saw shows and stuff like that. What so was the first show you saw in New York. The first show I saw in New York. Well, I mean I saw you know like stuff at Schaefer and stuff like that. You know it'd be like you know the Mother's of Invention or saw with, the Mother's of Invention with the Hampton Ooh. Grease Band. Stuff like that. You know, we would just do that kind of stuff. Um, the, first ba the first show I saw, though, was uh, The Left Bank um, at our local high school with this band It's Us opening. There was a local band. Originally, they were called The Orbitrons. And then when the, like, hippie thing hit, they changed their name to It's Us. And they had drove around in a Volkswagen van called The Us Bus. <laughs> and... Uh, they were good. They had a single, actually, that Tim Warren put out on Back from the Grave, Volume 7. I won't be checking that out, but Yeah, you... Anyway, and, that's, and you say you're not a punk. Um, so... You know, there were a lot of fanzines around in those days, and we just, we just drifted into this stuff, but we were record collectors. So for me, when, uh, you know, punk stuff started, we saw a band like the Ramones, who were obviously like a big change. It was just a new music thing, really. Um, you know, the... Um, I'm sure, you know, Lydia can confirm the early CBGB scene was like mostly old guys, you know, old gay guys. And then, you know, some teenage, you know, teenagers hanging out, getting free drinks from the old gay guys. And, you know, just bands play. It was just like, it was sort of, you know, the guys who, who couldn't really like make it at Max's, you know, would just like drift down there. And, you know, the Bowery was still the Bowery then. And, uh. You know, Giorno lived down the street in Burroughs. And it was just it was a weird it was just a weird scene, but it was an old it was like an old man scene in a lot of ways. Or it seemed to me, I was like eighteen or nineteen, and it's you know, people there were older. Older older gentlemen. That's why they called it punk. Um, but you know. They weren't gentlemen by reason. Well, they seemed so nice. They had smooth hands. Um, anyway. <laughs> You know, so the thing is, for me, it was like a musical thing. And I started writing about it only because, uh, you know, I would hang around and get drunk with, like, the guys from Punk Magazine. And then they would, I would send them, you know, articles in, in rhyme. And, <laughs> and they would never run them. And then a friend of mine got in, started doing New York Rocker. And uh, they would let me write for him because I knew more about certain bands and other things. And I sort of fell into it, and I spent... Uh, the last, you know, 40 years kind of doing that, just writing about different stuff. I, you know, New York Rocker, had a magazine, then Take It out of Boston. I wrote for tons of fanzines all over, you know, Touch and Go, End Result. I mean, all the DC zines. I mean, mid all the Midwest zines. Then uh, moved out to the West Coast, did a bunch of stuff out there, worked with bands, uh, punk bands out there, came back to the East Coast, restarted this magazine, Forced Exposure, uh, with a guy who was based in, uh, around the Boston area, who had started it as a hardcore zine, and then we kind of reimagined it, reconfigured it as a, not a hardcore zine anymore, but like a, a really a cultural zine. Because we, we always felt, uh, in a lot of ways, that you know, the, the music didn't exist really in a vacuum. And where most other people would put it purely in a political context, that's how they'd radicalized. To us, there was a lot of other radical culture that was around that was worth sort of that we were interested in, and whatever it was, just junk culture, um, whether it was uh, noir or science fiction or like weird fiction or just like weird music of all kinds. And uh, so did that for a while, then, you know, just other things. And I've just, uh, you know, I've kept on doing that uh, ever since, put out a lot of records uh, over that time. Chuck wrote a biography of Chuck Norris, 
wrote a Motley Crue quickie bio in a, in a week. It was 10 days from the, uh, what happened was. <laughs> How much you can pay for that? They give me uh, 12 grand. Well, that's why I took 10 days. Well, it's good. It was 60,000 words. It was like, what happened was Tom Carson, who was the music editor of the Village Voice then, was supposed to do this book on Motley Crue. They were doing a whole series. Ballantyne was doing a series of metal books called The Monsters of Metal. And uh, they came, came due, and they went to Tom Carson, and they said, uh, these book packagers, Metal and Morell and uh, whoever else it was, and they said, uh, Karen Moline, they said, well, where's the manuscript? He goes, ah, I didn't do it, and I'm not going to do it. So they were like, Coley just did that Chuck Norris bio. Like, they called me up, and they said, look, if you can get us 60,000 words in 10 days, we'll give you, I mean, you can, can you do it? And I was like, you know, absolutely. And I'd never heard them. So, <laughs> so I borrowed a record from Jimmy. And then I, uh, I got in touch with this guy. See, it was, it, Motley Crue wasn't doing any interviews then because one of their, you know, there'd been this car accident and all this stuff. And uh, so they were really sort of like staying away from the press. But I knew a guy who worked at Electra, and he let me go down and Xerox every single piece of print about them in the Electra thing. So I, was, I would just throw all this stuff in the computer. It could use 150 words, you know. So I would just be throwing it all in the computer. And I didn't write the intro because I didn't know anything about them. So when I finally got the rest of it done, I was like, oh, so I wrote the intro, and I wrote this, I wrote this thing about Vince Neil being in a, this car accident with this guy, and then, like, waking up in a jail cell all covered with, like, blood and stuff, and then I was, it was good, and, and uh, but then they were like, oh, my God, this is so negative. We can't really run this. So the lawyers, like, nixed that, but... But you got paid. I got paid, yeah. Oh, it was great. Anyway, uh, but anyway, so that's what I do. <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, the thing is, I, I mean, I also, as a collector, I mean, I've always been really interested in the, you know, I mean, you can, in one way, it's archive. I mean, I've, I've worked with archiving stuff, um, but, I mean, I sort of save a lot of things because, you know, they have a, a semiotic value for me, which means, you know, they're, they're just like, they're, you know, tangentially maybe they're involved with whatever's going on, but I've always kept all my correspondence and, you know, gig flyers and just all that kind of stuff so that I have a context for the history of my own life. Otherwise, it's as though I didn't exist, right? You could back me up on that. Are you a hoarder? No, but I would like to be. <laughs> but I've never really, I've never had the discipline I just, there's too much stuff I throw out. I like recycling. There's something about it. So, and you? I thought you'd ask. I'm Lydia Lunch. I'm not punk, although I'm more punk than you punks. I'm not a riot girl. I'm pre-riot girl. Well, you can be a riot. Well, I withstood the riots of Rochester at the age of five and eight when my house was the epicenter, so that was inspiring to me as a child. It did give me the sense of protest. I've been protesting my whole fucking life, mainly about everything, starting with my father, God the father, father of this country. At the age of 12, I knew I had a job to do, and that was um, like the heroes that inspired me, Hubert Selby, Henry Miller, the Marquis de Sade, Foucault, Violet Leduc, to document in every way possible my personal or my personal insanity and the political insanity that was happening at the time. So at 12, I started writing. I did my first performance at an acid party when I was 14 in Buffalo, New York. I was sold. Actually, my first piece of attention, I love negative attention, was um, hanging around at this place called the House of Guitars in Rochester, New York, that is, uh, so we have a collection of guitars and vinyl. And they used to have these incredible, crazy commercials on Friday and Saturday nights when there actually used to be really good rock shows on TV. I try to find one of those now. I mean, that's why you got YouTube, right? Okay. So I used to go in there and try to get on one of their commercials, and they would just laugh at me and go, ha, 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 ha. But um, a photographer walked in and saw me, and I guess this was, this was probably 73, so I was 13 or 14. Already pretty goth-looking, although I'm not goth either. I'm the original goth. And uh, took my photo and put it up at the University of Technolo Rochester University of Technology, and immediately controversy formed. Like, get those horrible, get that horrible girl off the wall. And I was like, ha, 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 yeah, all right. 
So I went to New York when I was 14, took the Greyhound bus, snuck out my bedroom window because I wanted to go check out the New York Dolls. Um, I still like men that dress like ladies occasionally, but they kind of broke the tradition of, well, whatever came before Motley Crue, because Motley Crue followed the New York Dolls. But uh, glam rock was very important to me. I mean, literature first inspired me, and then I would say glam rock and cock rock. But when I say cock rock, I mean like the Stooges, like real good cock rock, like big cock rock. Not your petty bullshit. And um, so I went to New York at 14, but I knew, I mean, what the fuck are you going to do? You're 14. So I went back and got some more money, and I, I just had to go to New York. I dropped out of school in the 10th grade. That's why I get paid to come and talk to you people who pay what your tuition. It doesn't matter what fucking tuition is. My English teacher actually inspired me to drop out of school because I refused to read crap like John Steinbeck when I'd already read the Marquis de Sade. Try to force a 15-year-old to read John Steinbeck. You're serious. I wasn't. I was. So I went to New York again, and I thought that I would go to New York because I consider myself a, a, a journalist, basically, that I needed to, there was, spoken word didn't exist, but I knew, not that I was going to invent it, but it was post-beat poetry. Um, I was already over Patti Smith, except for Piss Factory, a very good single. It was too rock and roll, it was too, di too traditional, and I thought I would go there and do, well, a format that didn't really exist at that point, which was spoken word. So, um, you know, I started going to the clubs. I don't know how we got into clubs at that age, but we did, and we'd always get free everything. Don't ask me why, cute faces, I guess we had them. Um, the first band I saw was Suicide, which that pretty much said, all right, that's it. I knew that whatever I was going to do had to be a rebellion against whatever it, it was that had already inspired me. And so I started sniffing around. Somebody gave me a broken guitar, and I decided to start a band that was half instrumental because words were so fucking important called Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. The name itself caused a lot of attention, and it was nothing to do with punk. It was no wave, and I will define no wave as uh, user-unfriendly, hardly ever melodic, confrontational, and opposed to punk, which is often a fashion or social statement, no wave is more about personal insanity. And what, com what connects no wave is, when you say punk rock, there's a wide definition, but you know that what you're going to hear. You say opera, you say country. You say no wave, you don't necessarily know what it's going to sound like, because it's not going to sound like each other. So that was just a movement, which it only ever is in retrospect, in my opinion, that formed of a collective of insane individuals that had coagulated, had come to a place that was bankrupt and completely dangerous, and decided to just go crazy. And with a broken guitar and a free rehearsal space because I had occupied an abandoned building and taught the drummer like a monkey how to play a fascistic beat, I created one of the most horrible dins ever heard, but extremely precise at the same time. It was just an instinctive, automatic uh, accomplishment using instinct only. No, well, there was technique, but uh, I knew I still don't even know any. I don't. I can't tell you a note, a chord. I've done. I don't know how many albums. I come at music differently. I think of music as the machine gun to the bullets I'm going to fire out of my mouth. All right. So I started to use music to get the words out, even though my first band was half instrumental. The titles mattered. And. At the same time, though, because I'm a musical schizophrenic, I had a, a band simultaneously that sounded nothing like that. I'm, my musical history is basically contradicting the sound. As I break from the tradition that inspired me, my bands or the music I do usually contradicts what just came before it because, well, that's what happens. Also, I'm, I, I conceive the idea. I don't like decide who I'm going to play with. I conceive the sound and then try to find the people who fit that sound. So uh, ba back to more like a Viennese situationist or Dada, I am more conceptual. I just happen to use music as part of the way that I antagonize the public at large. All of my work basically is about the imbalance of power, um, violent tendencies, violence against that which has caused me violence. It's not pretty. There are no trigger. I do not have safe rooms in what I do. It's not a safe thing. I'm dealing with very harsh issues in a very harsh way. I think more women need to make really ugly music, do ugly films, and let's reveal that side of us, which is what I still do, which is why 37 years after first performing, 
through a multiple a multiplicity of types of music and various art forms from exhibitions, exhibitionism, photography, video, spoken word. Um, Basically, I'm a curator, which I often involve other people in the curation of what I consider as the psychosis of my time and the politics and sexuality around it. That's what I do. You want got something to say? I'm still just Tanya Pearson. I'm just going to leave it She's at that. She's responsible for bringing us here. <laughs> Blame her. <laughs> do I have a question that I want to ask? Okay. Um... I don't know why, but go ahead. Yeah, do you want to start? Um, yeah. I'm not so fully prepared for this. this Byron, panel. you've done some work on the... Yes. Right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? How that why does the school have one fucking mic? I mean, again, we haven't got one mic. What's, what, what's up with that mic? It's bad. Um, can't you tell? I don't need a mic. Carry on. Tell us about the Sonic Youth Archives. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, you feature in them. Come on. Tell me about it. I have no idea. No, the, uh, Some of the poems uh, I wrote to Thurston, I'm telling you, I'm pretty cute. The, uh, um, you know, I have, I mean, I, I, I worked on uh, helping trying to organize a bunch of the stuff. They were doing a... Did he ever uh, give you a bubble bath? <laughs> just asking. Do you mean did handed more, one? Uh, did he ever give you a bubble... Oh, I just not. Do you mean physically... Yes! Handed, no, but he's well, given me bubble bath, like in a, in a bottle. You don't know what it's like. Go ahead, carry on, sorry. I just had to say. Wow. <laughs> Like in a kitchen? All right, New York bathroom, sometimes there's the bathtub in the kitchen. Right, sometimes yeah, you yeah, have yeah. To, No, actually, in an actual bathroom. Really? Yeah, ask him about it sometime. I will. Well, this Carry part, on. I didn't see this mentioned in the archive, but well, it sounds... You didn't have any of the bubbles saved? Like, Apparently like, not. How do you preserve there a was a, There was a bag a that bubble? had some, like, bubble film in it, and I didn't realize what it was. I just thought it was another bubble you bag. Better ask. Well, Maybe um, the soaps come. Yeah, yeah, true. But Sonic Youth actually did a museum, a traveling. Did you see the museum show, the Sensational Fix show? No, I didn't. It was that? Was there any reason for that? I didn't think so. I, I mean, I, I didn't think there was any reason for the museum traveling, but go ahead. But it was in Barcelona, I think, wasn't it? Well, maybe I wasn't there, Byron. Oh, I don't know. I think you might have been. Well, maybe I just avoided it because I'd rather have an up-close and personal experience with some of the members of the band, not others. Bubble though. bath. Well, okay. Anyway, uh, they did work on putting together like a big uh, traveling uh, museum was show. Great? Excuse was it great? Me? Was it great? It was good. Did you work on it? I helped some on it, yeah. It was, uh, you know, just sorting through all this, I mean, all the crap that they put together over the years um, because they had a pretty thorough... You know, like I don't know how they held on to some of that stuff, considering where they all where they lived and stuff like that. But in terms of early, you know, early flyers, like all sorts of like uh, written material that was uh, dealt with stuff. I think they ended up sticking it all in their rehearsal studios and stuff like that. So it all none of it had really been around. But when they really started emptying things out, it turned out there were uh, there were really like lots and lots and lots of uh, especially printed, you know, a lot of printed material, uh, paper stuff like that. But they put together, the, the show that they put together was pretty interesting, actually, because what they did was um, they also put together things from their own personal collections with it that contextualize it. So it would be like a, you know, f a batch of, uh, you know, Japanese Philip K. Dick paperbacks or Jim Thompson, you know, like a shelf of Jim Thompson books and different things like that, pieces of, pieces of work that had influenced uh, different parts of their performance history. And it was, uh, it was put together well, and it, it actually... They, it, it went around a bunch of museums. I don't think it ever showed like in New York or anywhere like that. It was mostly in Europe and Japan. Um, I don't think I could ever find a museum for it in New York. But they have a pretty good archive of, of material still. I don't know exactly what's going on with it. But, uh, you know, most bands, when you, when you really kind of get into the workings of that stuff, have a tendency to really not have all that much. Um, you know, it's, it's really very scattershot generally. It's like, you know, a bunch of, you know, lousy flyers from, you know, different things in poor shape. And, uh, you know, people go through different periods. I mean, there were, you know, friends of mine who, you know, have had, uh, 
you know, you ask about stuff, and then they have it, and then they have a drug problem, and they just like, they just like sell it all. You know, the first person who comes by and offers them fifty bucks, they take it to a used records. You know, it's just like the stuff really gets, uh, you know, distributed in very random kind of ways. Um, as somebody who's worked in used record stores for a very long time, I mean, I know that people just carry in like really interesting piles of stuff, and you're like, you know, where'd that? So I can't really think of like what happened with Brad when Bradley got evicted. Don't you don't know. remember? You don't remember? I Brad? Don't. I mean, Brad, do you remember? I remember Bradley. So right. Do you remember Bradley's collection? Of what? Of just shit? All the yeah, weird stuff it? he had? It all went into a dumpster when he got evicted. <laughs> you know, just like, you know, it just goes. Um, you know, when, uh, when people get evicted from their, their places, especially in, you know, neighborhoods that are getting flipped, you know, place people live in the city, it was a nice rent controlled place and the building gets sold, the, the status gets changed, all of a sudden, you, you know, the rent gets jacked up five times and it's like, oh, you know, I had all this stuff. And it's like, well. Should have called Byron. Well, they should have, but you know, nobody exactly. really thinks of it. I would come over with my pack mules and. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. You know, 40 mule train, but you know. It's a, uh, the thing is, I mean, I, in terms of like actual, like especially early punk stuff, a lot of it is so ephemeral that, uh, you know, once the, once the people who had like big lofts to keep all the stuff in New, like in New York, once those guys all died, stuff like that, if it didn't go somewhere, it really just all got, so much of it got trashed. Um, you know, I mean, there are, you know, because even talk to somebody like Danny Fields, you know, who really saved, like, everything. But, you know, he just put it in his closet, he just, like, have a closet jammed with stuff. You know, it's like, and his stuff went back to the 60s, you know. He, I'd talk to him about, like, oh, yeah, I saw this, like, you know, poster for the first Paul Tech show or something. I'd go, like, oh, yeah, I've got that, you know, in my, <laughs> in a closet, you know. And be like, well, you know, you should do something with it. And I guess he did. I Where'd he go? Yale? I think, I think Anthony went to Yale. Well, you should tell him who Danny Fields is. Danny Fields was uh, the Ramones manager and uh, was, uh, you know, the guy who introduced uh, uh, Edie Sedgwick to Warhol. And he's a Harvard, you know, gay Harvard guy, incredibly intelligent, um, worked for 16 Magazine, was responsible for the Beatles breaking up, and, uh, you know... Just a really good guy. There's a great uh, documentary that a guy from Hampshire did on him recently. He was up here uh, speaking. He's an incredibly funny, very funny guy. It was part of the uh, backroom scene at Max's when, you know, Max's was uh, uh, still. Max's Kansas City. Right, Max's Kansas City, which was uh, Mickey Ruskin's uh, place in New York. Mickey Ruskin was a famous uh, art collector. You know, you, how much can you, can you know, really contextualize all this stuff? People have to, you know, you have to assume people know a certain amount. Don't you? College students. I don't assume anything. Oh. Okay. Different generation. But, uh, but no, the Sonic Youth archives are really good. I mean, it, in, in, you know, I mean, I guess Pearl Jam probably has a good archive. But, you know, they're, you know, I mean, most, you know, REO Speedwagon probably has a fantastic, you know, pulsing archive of, of stuff. But, you know, Bands that really start with like, you know, living in like really crappy neighborhoods with no money and no real thought that anybody's ever going to like them have a tendency to not document themselves as well or take themselves as seriously because they're just, nobody takes them seriously. So they don't, they don't do it quite the same way. Uh, for some reason, I always knew from a very early age just to document everything. Um, I was obsessed with documenting everything. Uh, consider it just my time capsule and pretty much everything I've done I have I, I own my entire catalog and I have Weasel Walter has been helping me for the past two years like compile my archives and as, I've, as a nomad who's lived in many cities I usually had a two or four year time range in places that I would live um, I was amazed at how much stuff I'd actually been able to hold on to and that was from a few friends that just sometimes I would just leave an apartment and go I don't care and a friend would just go and gather the stuff, whatever it was. Um, I'm not a big collector of anything. Like, I don't have a record collection. I don't have a stereo. I don't have a TV. I don't collect any of that kind of crap. Um, I don't have a lot of other people's material. But somehow I managed to hang on to a lot of correspondences. Like, I have Mike Giraud's bodily fluids on correspondences. I have correspondence from 
Will Oldham when he was just 14, big enemy, pen pal. I have live recordings in a various, ver in a variety of formats of almost every band I've done that someone has recorded. Sometimes like in, in Barcelona where I lived for eight years, I have every recording I did there that somebody documented. And now I just, it, it's, uh, it's just been archived and I'm not gonna give it to an institution. I don't want it to go to a school. Um, when I go to a school and see the archives, they look dead to me. Um, I don't like shit just, kept, my, they're already in boxes. It's like I, I'm hoping to do with my archives is first of all have a virtual, you know, library of it so that it's accessible in all, you know, whatever format, it's all there. I'm not gonna give it or donate it to anybody. It is up for sale, but I would rather sell it to a private, like a museum and have something that was more like a living embodiment of not only my stuff, but all the collaborators that I worked with, because I worked with an incredible amount of collaborators, and most of my, my material, especially musical, involves a lot of other people, as, as well as curating a lot of spoken word shows. So it's not just like my museum that I want, but I would like a place that was actually living, breathing, not boxed up, that people could go in and then see not just what I've done, but the wide, outreach of people, whether it was literary or spoken word or, or visual artists, and especially musicians, that for some reason I felt necessary to collaborate with at that time. To me, that's the most interesting thing of, of what I've done. It's not just that I've been stubbornly doing it as hardcore as I have for all this time, but who I was able to convince to join this, like, because when I'm creating something, I mean, you do consider it like the sacred union where bullshit to just stay outside of it. That's why I've been a very successful collaborator. I just ask Weasel, I'm pretty easy to fucking work with in spite of how bitchy I can fucking be. When I'm creating, I'm there to encourage other people to do exactly what they want to do and to do it to the extreme and to find a way to do that and find a way to tour and find a way to document it. So I always say my job is 9 to 5. That's 9 a.m. to 5 fucking a.m because that's how many hours you have to put into a day if you want to have, I'm not even saying success. My success is the fact that I've done almost more than most people I fucking know because I'm that stubborn and I will work that hard. And still, people don't know who the fuck I am and you know what, probably never will and that's fine. Because I know who I am. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know me, right? Mm. You know me though, Tanya knows. Yeah, I do. She does. Yeah, you're great. No beef about it, she knows me well. Besides being great, she still knows me. So I'm going to ask you a question that I you're going to fucking hate, though. Well, I can always punch. Okay. It's punch rock. But I didn't write it. Jeremy you, wrote no, it. No, no, no. Well, let him <laughs> fucking ask it then. You don't have to ask these. You don't have to ask these. You can ask your own questions. Why can't um, you ask it? Well, the you thing wrote is, it. I mean, you, so you think it's wrong for a, you know, I think that it's. I didn't say anything. I didn't think I said anything was wrong. Yeah, you what, did. What did I say? Well, you said you thought. I don't like. That it wasn't, you didn't like the fact that the material would be inert. Kind I don't of. like the fact that my material would be inert. Right. I, I, but I, I want it all to be virtual, but I don't like the fact that it's in a fucking box in another closet. Right, but the thing is though, yeah, I mean it's okay. always, as soon as it's, through. I mean it's, as soon as it's archived to yeah. me in a way, it's, yeah. it's removed from the excitement of its original thing. And it's there to be sort of, I mean, studied or appreciated, but in a completely different context. I, uh, I'm not against way. that. I'm just saying right. I would prefer, if right. possible, uh -huh. to have something that was more vibrant. So and, what do you think would do? I'm just curious. Well, how you... I, uh, talk to me in two weeks. Okay. Seriously. Seriously. Okay. I mean, I want people to be able to get their hands on the shit as well. I mean, right. I want them to feel it. I would like, I, ideally, I'm saying, right. I would like to set up an environment which, which was like the environment I do create in, uh -huh. so people can go and rifle through the shit. Like the exhibition I had last year in New York called You Are Not Safe in Your Own Home. I mean, that's my personal shit, poetry, whatever, used whatever, sheets, <laughs> that people could go in and uh, be absorbed in the environment. I uh -huh. mean... You know, that's also like a very situationist type thing. It's like I want, I, I prefer, which is why I, I prefer spoken word or performances like last night that are very intimate because I want you to be in it. I don't want you to just be like rifling, okay, rifle through it as well. That's why it should be all online. That's why everything should be free to download. That's why I want it there. But I want you to smell it, if you know what I'm saying. I, I, too well. Mm. <laughs> Sit a little closer. What was the question? We didn't ask. Good. Do you envision something 
So this sounds like something you would do now while you're here, but what about in 150? Do you imagine building something that exists in a thousand years? No, the planet's not going to exist in a thousand <laughs> fucking years. It'd be silly. No, I, I mean, I look. I can't think that far ahead. No. I mean, it's all online anyway. It's all going to be online. I just want one place for it to be online and one place for it be, where people can get in and smell my sheets. Literally. I mean, that's important. To smell, to, to, to feel it. Yeah. And to look at, I mean, this is why we like old books still. The smell of the books. Right. As opposed to looking at something online. I want to smell it. I want to feel it. I want to be in the environment. I, w I would like to create that ideally. I'm not saying it's wrong to have shit in boxes where people can go, that's great to have anything anywhere compiled so people can go and dig through it. I'm saying, I would prefer. Yeah. Which is why I'm not interested in universities that charge $50,000 for one student and then buy an archive for $50,000. That's why I was really pissed off at Smith when I went there and talked. And they were first building a library for $70 million, and then the next time I was there was $100 million, And I'm like, and I'm supposed to talk to you about selling my fucking archives? Where's the, what about that extra $30 million? I'm not asking for $30 million. <laughs> What I'm saying is... I don't like that concept, that 30 million more goes to brick and mortar when you could like, support how many fucking people for that? And I suggested everybody at Smith go door to door and we, just to, to raise money for my archives place was a sarcastic joke. And you could just knock on the door and go, you do this the easy way or the hard way. It's for the lady at lunch archive. You can give us five dollars, ten dollars, or you can break your fucking window. I thought that was a good idea to get money. Still could work. Well, one of the, one of the ex-professors broke her fucking hand trying. <laughs> That's not really true, but yeah. I'm exaggerating. I can't wait to do this online. I'm going to be in so much trouble. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Well, huh? No, but I mean, I wasn't even planning on being on this one. I was just going to watch. and. and We're almost done. It doesn't worry. Yeah. We can just do karaoke from now. Um, Close it out with some karaoke. Well, I don't want to get like... In my time of dying... Break it up a bit. Uh, so tedious. <laughs> Die in here. Yeah. Well then, carry on. Well, you know, there were some questions about the idea of uh, creating your own meet? history. Excuse huh? me. How did we meet Byron? How did we meet? I don't know this guy from. An I don't know how we met. Angela Yeager introduced us. Okay. At the bar on St. Mark's Street, next to Manic Panic, when she was working at Manic Panic. All right. And then. We were like what, twelve years old each? It was like. Seven, 77 or 78, and you, I had a beer, uh -oh. and you knocked it over on me. <laughs> Why did you do that? Because. I was flirting? I don't know what it was. You were like, you were like, something about, you didn't really like the, my looks. And you, I didn't like your looks. And you were talking about that, and then I you just like went, like you went looks. like, and you knocked this beer over in and my lap, and I was like. In your lap? Yeah, I was like. Punk. I was like, wow. So that's, that's when we met. And then what happened? You took off. <laughs> You were like, okay, I'm out of here. It was like me, Angela, Hillary, any anxiety. Do you fear me having this less water near your grouch? Just asking. That's why the pictures. I've down gotten there. used to it. <laughs> over you've the got, years. You've gotten used to me wetting your crotch. Yeah, over the wish. years. You know, that's fine. But yeah, that's how. But then you would hitchhike around the country. Yeah, yeah. To yeah, see my band aid I'd spy. I'm like, who is this fucking weirdo? That's true. And just in Byron's, to give Byron a bit of. Life has basically been spent promoting other people. But Forced Exposure was a very important magazine that featured incredible gonzo journalism. And, I mean, it was just very unique. And gonzo journalism, I mean, is very little of it right now that exists. And, and it captured a period in time that was, that, that was fine, but between a lot of other things. So as he was saying, we thought that it was about culture, not just about a certain time, but it went from hardcore magazine to something that really, in, encompassed film and it could be film from now or noir, be science fiction, whatever they felt like fucking writing about it went in there, but it went in there with a certain intensity of, of writing. And I know that some of my intense art reviews were just the most insulting thing ever written about other bands. We won't go into that. Now, one, two, three, four, how do I hate you? Let me cut the fucking ways. Anyway, um, I did a little writing for Forced Exposure, but the magazine really existed like no magazine. It was a magazine, I wouldn't call it a fanzine. It existed like no other magazine really has since. It had such a wide range of writers. And what was interesting is the, the, the printing was really small. It was so dense and packed that, you know, 
there's just unbelievable amount of, of gonzo journalism, really, for the most part, promoting shit that was outside uh, the norm, that, that stretched all, you know, all the boundaries. That's true. It was a good project. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, one thing we got, we were going back to, though, which I thought was interesting, was you've done documentation of your own stuff as you go along. Well, other people have documented it and given to me. It's like I, I right. knew to document it. It's right. not like I'm, you know, I was into a selfies. Right. <laughs> I still don't do fucking selfies. But the thing is, in a way, you know, I found, I mean, I've, like, uh, you know, you talk about, I did that No Wave book with Thurston, right? And we did. Oh, yeah. I did. That love letter to No Wave. So I like to call yeah, it. I mean, it was good. good. I mean, but I did, I did 400, I transcribed 480,000 words of interview for that book. I ended up using about 30,000. But the thing is, the, day laborer. the only reason that it could be sort of as accurate as it was was also because Thurston and I had sort of been there when it went on. So when people told you, like, you know, no, that this happened before that, you know, like, yeah. I, don't, you know I don't care how you remember it. Oh, yeah, well. This happened, and then that happened. And yeah, it was yeah. like stuff like that. And I think that it makes it really difficult to accurately, you know, either document your own thing, or then especially to, to doc, you know, to go back into, into well, these I, archives, I, try to I, figure I, out. When I say documenting, I mean get it recorded, have uh -huh. a live recording of it, have this, keep the script, keep the text. I don't, you know, uh, the documentation of live performances, of which I have a pretty big amount, right. is, you know, it's just something that had to be done. I was also able, when I had a project, when I say documenting, somehow I was always able to get a re the record out. Right. Um, so that's how I was documenting. When I had a concept, I was always able to make that film. Mm -hmm. So when I say documenting, I use that very loosely, but to, in in to encompass both things that were released to the public and, and not. Right. So. Well, yeah, that's why we called it that, because just being in an archive isn't necessarily documentation. A recording is but it's interesting because the thing is when there are periods where a lot of stuff is going on in a really compressed period. And especially when you think back to the, like the, if you call it the early punk era, say like in this late 70s, what would happen was like if you wanted, like the NME would come out, but it would take four weeks for it to get to New York to get to the gem spa. Like you're always reading like an NME that was four or five weeks late. But it still had this incredible impact, but it had this impact that was in a weird, like it was delayed. So then there would be reactions to that inside of what people were doing, but something had already changed in England. So it was like, there were all these weird, like really weird, they're almost like time slips in a way because information traveled and such, you know, people wrote a lot, I mean, I wrote letters two hours every morning, you know, to like other, like, you know, editor, you know, people who, collectors and fanzine dudes and people who are in bands and whatever, and it was slow. You know, it would take, the, the way that information traveled then was so pre-digital, and it was just like, you know, it was like putting it on a camel or throwing a <laughs> bottle into the ocean, and, you know, keep, you know, keep puffing and it'll get to England eventually. Um, you know, and then English guys would send you stuff, and the English Xerox technology was so horrible. <laughs> you would get, like, these flyers that looked like, what is this? Like, it's like when Thurston worked at that stupid copy shop. It was like, what? I've never seen such bad Xerography in my life. It was like crazy. Like, how do you get this, like, all gray like this and wet looking? You know, it's I mean, camping, like. but I know, you know, it was, there, was a, there was a lot of that, but it was weird. When things would happen, people would be reacting to stuff, but they would be reacting to it in these weird sequences. But a band would play, would do something at Max's, or you'd do something somewhere else, and it would really, like, it would ripple down, like, super fast. And then somebody else would be like, you'd see somebody the next time they played, and it would be like, oh, they've absorbed this from that. And it's almost impossible. It's so hard to, like, fit the, act, the real chronology of some of these things together. I think it's really... That's what it really requires, getting into correspondence and like this right. kind of stuff, because that's the only place that it exists. Plus, everybody was so wasted. I mean, 
when Angela gave me those letters, I was, there was a book that I did that Angela sent me all these letters back that I'd written her in the 70s. And I'm like, I'd send her these detailed things of shows that if anybody had asked me, I'd say, like, I never saw this <laughs> band. No. But it'd be, like, really deep, you know? Right. And because, you know, you're, like... You're, high on life. Yeah, very high on... Very so enthusiastic about but, I mean, but the possibility. When I, was, when I was getting all my shit together, I mean, I had to call in, you know, Weasel, who has a better comprehension, because he had the distance to follow oh. it, of what I was doing exactly when. Right. It's like, there were letters, I didn't even know who the person was. Even when he told me, I, like, I still didn't know. I'm like, what? I don't even know that person. They're right. like, we have eight letters from him. I'm like, I don't even fucking know who he is. Right. Like about like, the guy from Royal Trucks. I'm like, I don't even, I don't even remember this. <laughs> so, you know, it was important for me to, I mean, I had, I had two people that were helping me that were like, that, that knew better than I did mm -hmm. what exactly was going on when. Because, I mean, I'm living it, I'm doing it. Right. And I'm documenting it, but I'm not keeping a fucking diary. It's right. like, I'm not like, so yeah, so we have the correspondences to make. We have you know that kind of thing, and um, but it was I had to call in you know reinforcements to frame it up because I had no idea. Like really, I when what? <laughs> yeah, I'm right. busy doing it. I'm not you know I'm doing it. So right. No, it's true. But but it's, that to me is the really interesting thing about like really having ar like archives. The difference between like an archive. People talk about the zine things because it's like. Reporting on something and then having the first-person documentation of even if it's just a, even if it's just the uh, observing it, but then also if you're participating in it, then you start to yeah. understand. Like somebody says, like, "Oh, I was just reading this article," and then it's like, "Oh, okay." I mean, that sort of that's where I heard about, "Oh, you know this," or "Oh, Harry Smith was at Tier Three yeah. last night," or, you know, like whatever. It's like, "Oh, you know, I realized who that old guy was." You know, it's it's just you know there are a lot of things that just happen, especially if you're in a city and you're young and you're poor and you're just like bouncing around, which a lot we of did. these, a lot we of these did. scenes were like that for a, for long, for at least spurts of time, you know, and uh, it's the way that, the way that that stuff is really only documented is in correspondence in a lot of ways, or, you know, there used to be people who would go around and do that war whole thing of just like taping, you know, they just have tape recorders and just tape. You just hear, you know, like Angela's tapes. It's like, oh, there's like a snippet of like a contortion song and then her and Hillary <laughs> talking about, you know, like some stupid ass thing. And, you know, or, or then they, oh, Michael McMahon comes. You know, it's, it's right. there are these weird, you know, oral documentations of this stuff. That it, but it was just like, you know, kids who were growing up on the east side of Manhattan, like doing this stuff or whatever. It's, and it's a, it's a really fascinating, fascinating thing to go through. But, you know. I think there are a lot of people who are conscious of it in a way that, you know, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm 60 this year, you know, and people my age are like, you Hard know, to believe you made it, my friend. I know. I mean, I, the fact that I made 23 yeah, blew yeah, my fucking fact mind. The fact I made 19 was you know, spectacular. And, uh, you know, but I, people get aware of, of, the, of what some of this stuff is. It's like if they still have it. And people who, you know who find all this stuff when they're like, you know, their parents like croak and then there's all this crap in their house. And they're like, oh wait, I got this stuff. I think are not quite chucking it the same way that they, yeah, yeah. they maybe did at one time. They have a, there's a consciousness of what is uh, interesting, potentially interesting or, or important in that kind of a way as opposed to just like Well, and snapshots. time capsules so, are important. I mean, it, right. it is, especially the more personal I mean, that, that is the snapshot. So, you know, right. what, what you, when you take, what I do is I take the personal experience and then I manifest it into something that's like uh, a speech, a spoken word, text, song, movie. Right. But you're taking the experience. But when you actually are capturing that experience, I mean, that's the real time capsule there. So yeah. that's why the correspondences are, are, are interesting. Yeah. That's why in my archives I've got like, this is only from nine people, 2,000 mm. emails dumped in there. Right. Wait till I go through a few more. So I have like <laughs> thousands of emails, right. and I've kept them, and I got them all. I got a lot of them printed, right. but that's where a lot of the poetry is because we used to write letters, yeah. and now we have email. Yeah. So you know, it's actually faster sometimes for me to write an email. Right. So I've got. I mean, I think the email the email part of my collection is pretty interesting. But Good luck digging through. About ten years. A lot of incriminating shit in there. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, I think we used up our time. Good. Excellent. Oh, oh. shit. <laughs>
Maybe you do. He just turned 60. It's Raven. I hear the clock ticking. Great. How about any answers? Anybody got an answer out there? Yeah. The writings of Lester Bangs. Well, Lester Bangs lived hard, fast, died young, and was the one of the original Gonzo journalists who would just, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, Byron is, in my opinion, the, the, the inheritor to that throne, but uh, he was just a, a poetic, insane, hard living, hard drinking, hard drugging person that died of a heart attack after, I think, cleaning up and taking two Valiums. Yeah. But his writing just, he just referenced so many different kinds of music, but it, it, it's, it's, it just Google Lester Bangs. I think he's an important person to realize also, because he got it bridged from the late 60s, early 70s, the mid 70s, and then he died in like what, 80s, yeah, 70, 80, I guess. 79, 80. So, so it, it's interesting the range of the time that he lived and what he was documenting. Um, and you know, he's got, he's, there's some books published, but. Uh, I think just to know what kind of passionate writing there used to be, really good writing, really poetic, hardcore rambling, stream of consciousness, that's important to me. You know, I find I find a lot of fanzines thin. I find like the writing poor. I'm glad people document. I find it not very poetic. I don't find that they go on enough. I don't feel they they're extreme enough. They don't dig deep enough, and. I mean, that's why I really like gonzo journalism, like extreme account, run on. If you're going to, you know, write an article about something, and, and this is like Byron's forte as well, and you're really going to dig into what it is, I, I want to read that. I want to see that. It's always like, I don't want to read a fucking comment. This is why I don't do Facebook comments. I don't read them. I write an essay. All right, go write a fucking essay. Go write a book. <laughs> you're welcome. Lester Bangs, kids. Yeah, Lester's good. I mean, he also had very good taste. Which is, you know, He loved me, so weird. I don't know if that's good taste or not, but that yeah. was weird. That was fucking weird. Yeah. Fun. Byron said that New York in that period was a bunch of old men. It's true. I was like 16, 17, and a lot of those people would literally run from me, probably because I was pouring beer on their crotch. I don't know. A lot of those guys would kind of run away when they saw me coming. Well, I had a baby face. I don't know what the problem right. is. Too scary. I'm... Um, I'll just say the one thing, and I'm going to say this whole panel. Um, I probably have a very different opinion than like everyone, but I'm just so tired of listening to what men have to say about anything and about what they think about scenes and about what they think about <laughs> women performing or <laughs> writing or anything really. So uh, I'm more of um, I'm more into a I'm interested in like a separatist approach to historicizing any and all women who have been left out of music history, which is like most of them. And um, I'm interested in right now, at this point in my life, listening to, to Lydia's music, reading Lydia's books, reading what she wrote herself. Alice Bagg's books, Michael just brought me um, Michelle Gonzalez's um, autobiography, which I can't wait to read that. I'm just really kind of sick of listening to what men think about anything. But I might change my mind in a couple of years. <laughs> but that's where I am now. And that's like the basis of um, my project and what I'm, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, sorry. No, that's good. Okay. No, Do you have were, anything? There were some scenes that were really integrated. Mm. Well, yeah, no, yeah, like certain. I think that No Wave well, was. Scenes. I think No Wave was very integrated. No I mean, mm -hmm. nobody. Look, there were a lot of female filmmakers, painters, right. visual artists, musicians. We did not feel at all that we were gender sided. You know, first of all, I don't don't let the tits fool you because don't think I feel like I don't. So I don't even define myself by any gender, and I never did, and I never felt outside of any scene I was in. And I, but 
I never felt as if I was truly in that scene because I was always a fucking outsider. I'm outside by gender, I'm outside by my political view and my sexual behavior. So I'm outside of all of that, yet I would dip in, go in, create, whatever. No Wave was interesting because nobody cared about that at all. It wasn't an issue. And even though America at that time was in, and New York was in the most politically corrupt and bankrupt, you have no idea how bombed out that city was and uh, how devastated it was. And we, we I mean, at least my generation of No Wave, I mean, we were very much influenced by a few things. Charles Manson, an ending the summer of love, Vietnam War, Kennedy assassination, Richard Nixon, and all those negative things, yes, done by men. So that when we actually, we were very negative, but actually then when we found this pocket, we weren't looking at what was between your fucking legs. And nobody was acting. There, there were it, nobody, and there was also no all this political correctness that's happening now. To me, is a crock of fucking shit. It's white privileged people who are too scared and need to be safe, so they want to box everybody. It's the new puritanism which is happening. At that point in the late '70s, there were no holes barred. Everything was open, and that's how you got experience and you learned. If you, there's something happened to you that you didn't like, you learned to fucking deal with it. You didn't run to a safe room. You learned to deal with it and to stand up for yourself, to take a stance, and then maybe to document it. And that was a really big difference. So at that period, nobody was feeling, at least in my circle, which was pretty wide, as if we were being ostracized. We were all poor. We were all insane. We were all hypersexual. We loved drugs. We stayed up all night. We got shit done. And bad shit happened, and you dealt with it. And you dealt with it, and it made you stronger, and it made you better, because it was experience. And a lot of good shit happened because you were able to deal with that possible bad shit, because the whole country is bad shit. Because this whole fucking country is bad shit. So you can't really isolate yourself in your safe little college communities. You have to realize what is out there. And all this safe room bullshit and this PC crap that I see is really highly fucking annoying. It's a big, ugly, harsh world out there. And the way that you reconcile that is you get stronger, you know who your friends are, and you avoid the fucking enemy at all times. I don't know, sorry, but I just get really uptight around communities that are so fucking uptight and want to be so safe. It's not safe. You're not safe. Deal with it. You're not fucking safe. You're not safe. I don't know why I feel so strong when I I'm not. I know you. I'm not safe. You're not safe. Get tougher, and you better enjoy every fucking minute because you could die in a drive-by tonight. Well, not here, of course. People don't even lock their fucking doors. Well. Lock your doors. <laughs> Sorry to end on such a positive note, but just expressing well. myself. Oh wait. <laughs> yeah. Stand up, be heard. I can't hear you back there. How do we document the I mean, sorry, history of sex in the 70s, sex in the punk rock, sexual violence, sexual predation? Sexual have you seen violence? any of my films? I have. Thank you. You read my book? Well, there you go. I'm doing my part to document sexual violence and, and to also do, to, to understand how, if you're a victim of sexual violence, you might become very violent yourself. And this is the underbelly of psychosexuality that has always been a theme I've been investigating just in my own, because I don't see it documented from a female point of view. I think that's why you can buy my books, Those Brave Enough, Paradoxia, it's over there. Because we need to deal with that, because it's a vibe, it's an energy, it's a freedom that doesn't exist at this point. Well, I guess you got your Tinder. Yes, you know, Christy Hines' autobiography, she, she, she t says roughly, you know, if you're a young woman in the wrong place, wearing the wrong stuff, she intimates it's your own fault, right? And then the other, another story is Jackie Fox and Kim Fowley and the Runaways and the controversy about how others have responded to that. So this stuff is coming out now, and, and at the time the attitude was, you deal with it, you find your friends, you protect yourself or whatever, but we don't have that same attitude, and looking back on it, it's, it's hard to look back on that and say, well, they should just deal with it. We have different attitudes now. And so how do we do that is my question. How, how do we do think, what? How do we well, deal with how it? Do we, how do we approach that and sort of, I, I'm not just going to look back at the Jackie Fox story and say, well, that's the way it was in the 70s, you know? I mean, I guess that's part of it. it well, it is the way it was in the yes, 70s, right. but it's not the way everyone, you know, it's, what, what I don't like is, why at the time didn't you go out and just say, hey, motherfucker, cut that, there's a party of people. 
So to me, it's like self-victimization often. I'm not saying that women are not molested, abused, attacked, insulted, violated, and molested every step of their fucking life, and the possibility exists. But you have to know from the, and you got to teach your fucking daughters. It's not enough to just say, I don't like that. You better learn, look, you know what? A hard dick is going to be soft if you punch it one time. Trust me. Trust me. That's going to end the story. Trust me. Trust me. And teach your fucking sons. Exactly. And you know what? Mothers, understand your son so they don't become serial fucking killers and teach them what emotions are. I'm going to always blame the parents. All right? So don't stop breeding, first of all. Don't have possible serial killers or victims of such. You know, we look, Camille Paglia, lover or loather, I do both. She's the one that had a very good take on this. If you go into a room drunk with a man and you don't expect him to act like a man, you're a fucking idiot. So don't go in the room drunk. Don't do it. Yes, wear what you want, but if you're going to, expect the cat calls. And you know what? Defend yourself. That's how you have to. You can't have it both ways. Men are dumb. Men are ignorant. They're animals. So what? You're supposed, they're, they're supposed to change? We don't know this? Duh. I mean, really? I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Oh, yeah. Be nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> God, I just don't get it. A different vibe. Exactly. And, you know, what I don't like is now in New York, there's like a few women calling out about mol molestations, insulting when people are really molested, and accusing people of behaving like drunken sexual beings. Don't go in a room with a drunken musician if you don't want to get a hand up your fucking skirt. It's quite simple. Oh, don't do that. Well, you better be more assertive. End of discussion. Thank you. <laughs> well, that is the end of discussion. I know. Really the end. <laughs> Anything else? We're about time. Self-defense class down the hall. <laughs> yes. You oh, I'm wrestling. Why do we oh, care to make Why do we care to make why do we care to create archives? You know, what is so fun about it? What is that? I'm so glad you, you, you set yourself aside. You were not a punk, you said. No, I'm not. Yeah, I love new wave. I love no wave. And I love all the waves. But that I love punk. Why do you do it? It's spontaneous. Punk is now. Punk. Yeah, but why are you asking me about punk? I don't give a shit. No, don't, don't, don't have to do it. You better not. I mean, why I documented it is because I was trying to document my own progress through a hyper-insanity that I was born onto. So that's why I documented what I did, whatever form that took. Yeah, but you're not a punk, so... Exactly, so I'm not answering this. I'm done with the question. I thought we would be talking about punk. Oh. <laughs> is that right? You can talk all you want about it. How, how I'm out of here. global sense? <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah, there's no problem with that. You just have to do one, you know? You can't set a time in history and a place and uh, a group of individuals that uh, act uh, a certain way and, and, and say this is a function. Can I just, I'm going to say one thing, okay? I'm not Lydia Lynch, I'm not. That, uh, one of, the, one of the questions that Jeremy had sent me was, it was a comment about uh, Malcolm McLaren's son was threatening to burn $5 million worth of punk memorabilia. And you know what? It must be really nice to be in a white man in a position of privilege where they're already fucking documented. So you burning <laughs> like $5 million of punk memorabilia because you're not erased from history. I think... I'm, when I think of punk, Lydia is not punk. She's fucking no wave. This is a documenting punk panel, but punk being a blanket term, no wave being like an offshoot of that. Um, but I, I just think of, of all of this stuff in very gendered terms. And for you to say that you can't document punk or you shouldn't, it's like you're, me I mean, you're a guy. Like you have a cultural context. You have points of reference. When I was growing up, do you know, I had to find her through a Sonic Youth song, which she really loves, 
um, <laughs> from Death Valley 69. And then this was like pre-internet and how long it took me to find, to like order one of her books or to find any more information on Lydia Lunch or any information on any woman who wasn't some like figurehead in the punk girl, in the punk scene or in the riot girl scene. It's a, it, it's a very privileged point of view for, for people. And this happened on the Facebook event page too. It was a bunch of like, you know, kids and then some, some older people and I tried to have conversations with them um, just to come and listen and participate in this discussion because a bunch of people wrote on the Facebook page, um, you can't document, you, how do you document punk? We're not lab rats, or people shouldn't be studied. And a lot of them were guys. And it's like, well, of course it doesn't matter to you because your history is very readily recorded and mine is not. That's, I'm telling you my perspective. It does to me. I don't know what the question oh, well, is. She doesn't know. I just asked her. No, I don't. I, I don't like Malcolm McLaren. I was using it as an example because he's manager of the Sex Pistols, and was married to like. I know exactly. Well, I think. I don't think I know the question. I don't know. You know. In terms of in in terms of documenting it. I think all that that really comes up is there. There's a uh, there's subculture that gets documented uh, because it creates artifacts and it creates uh, w whatever coverage in different places. And there's a specific area of time that punk rock existed in whatever way it did, and it was covered, uh, and it created its it created documents of its own and it created documents uh, by people who observed it and reacted uh, correctly or incorrectly to any of it. And that's just, it's just a, it's a slice, it's a slice of time that this stuff exists and it gets put under uh, in an umbrella because it's an easy categorization to make. Um, so I think it just refers to a, a period of time, really. And why anybody documents anything to begin and with or makes any kind of music is because they know that somewhere out there there's another weirdo, even if there's only one or two. Or it's communication. That you know? feels like you do. The only reason I continue to do what I do is, and I don't care if there's five people or 500 in the audience, I know it's for three people there that are desperate to have whatever it is they're getting from me. And I will continue to do it for those three people, whether there's three or, or 300 or 3,000. That's great, but they don't have to be hanging on weapons. They can create their own scene. It's true, but the thing well, is, if Most people have. They don't need to, to move from their freaking chair. I mean, come on. It's true, but the thing is, if artifacts are created, they're going to be, they exist. Tell me you All don't of have a, sudden, a record collection. Your whole record collection is a document of other people's fucking punk. stuff. So what does that matter? It's, it's punk because the punk I live, while uh, I was one, because I'm not anymore, if you can, you can tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't take a single picture, or none of the people I related, uh, or none of the, 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 the circle uh, I was living in ever uh, recorded anything. A single picture. That's probably for the best. A single picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you. There's nothing to, 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 to archive from that. You just have to live it. It's a singer. Okay. Well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, nobody's really here. Nobody's actually going to be following you around for the catalog that doesn't exist, so I don't think you have, I think you're, you're perfect that you didn't document it. <laughs> I think that's great. That was a great concept. Including Grace. We're going to take a break. <laughs>